haciendo un lado Tu color y mi color Tu color y mi color Vayamos haciendo un lado Vayamos haciendo un lado Tu color y mi color Tu color y mi color Vayamos haciendo un lado Ya no tenemos razón para ignorar el amor, para ignorar el amor, es tiempo de reflexión. Welcome once again, bienvenidos. Uh, my guests today are uh, Josephine Talamantes and Andy Carey. And I'm going to begin by uh, asking them to share just a little bit about what they're working on as a way of, uh, of you getting to know them a little bit. And then uh, we'll join together in conversation. And I'm looking forward to chatting with them about wherever the conversation leads, but especially about what it is about the borderlands that they have uh, fallen in love with. And also perhaps a little bit of talk about philanthropy, which is an interest that they share in common, philanthropy here in the borderlands. Uh, but I'm gonna begin with just uh, a welcome and a, a brief check-in uh, with Josephine, uh, Josie Talamantes, a historian from San Diego, California. Uh, Josie co-founded Chicano Park in 1970 and helped develop it into a, a cultural national historic landmark containing the largest collection of artistic murals uh, in the United States. Uh, Josie was also the chief of programs for the California Arts Council and served as the director of the Centro Cultural de la Raza here in San Diego. And she's been on the board also of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture. Will you join me with a round of applause as we welcome uh, Josie Talamantes uh, to uh, las noticias from the border. Josie, uh, bienvenida, and uh, que hay de nuevo? What have, you been, what have you been working on these days? What's keeping you busy? <laughs> well, thank you, John and uh, Via, for inviting me to this plática. Uh, very exciting times right now, lots going on. Uh, I'm the chair of the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center, <clears throat> and we've been working on a lot of different uh, things, in particular, uh, we are opening up this month with an artist in resident, uh, which is Herbert Siguenza, which will be doing uh, oral histories uh, and, and taking that information with uh, individuals and creating a play at, uh, that will be presented next year. Uh, it was funded in part by uh, Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center and the California Arts Council. Um, and no one needs uh, uh, to be experienced to participate. So if you're interested, uh, go to our website, www.chicanoparkmuseum.org, and you can see the letter of invitation. We've Great. been- uh, Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be sure to put that, uh, we'll put that link in the chat room too here on the Zoom, and we'll also put it on our Facebook page so that people can connect. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I would say the other things we're working on, uh, you know, we were uh, awarded use of the facility at 1960 National Avenue. We're still working with the city to bring it up to code. Um, everything pretty much is finished with the exception of the floors. So we're hoping, we're hoping we will get the floors done soon and have an opening next year. Uh, we're in partnership uh, with the uh, Chicano Park Steering Committee, uh, USD, uh, <clears throat> and uh, other organizations for the Turning Wheel Bus, which is a bus that we um, uh, that provides access to students and educational and visual uh, exhibitions. Uh, we're right now looking at the big digital divide in San Diego County and uh, looking to garnish resources so that we could um, cre uh, create the <clears throat> Chicano Park and the museum and the bus as a hotspot uh, for students on Saturdays and after school. Um, there's been a lot of articles that have come out recently that have showed uh, that students in our communities are falling behind with the online learning. We know by looking at maps that uh, all the coastal area, those students pretty much have access, but down in our community in particular, District 8, National City, Chula Vista, we don't have the access. And so um, it's a big problem in this area. 
They're saying that students in the spring of last year fell behind by about seven months, but within our community, we're probably closer to 10 months to more than a year. So we're looking at this project and seeking resources to bring it to uh, the next step of fruition for us and acting as a hotspot. We know that the city is identifying uh, parks and recreational centers and in uh, Logan Heights, they've identified the Logan Heights Library that'll be a hotspot, which, which is a good thing, but it's not enough. And so we're looking to help build that. Um, just a lot going on. We talked about funding and I'll, I'll, I'll step off a bit. We know yeah. that uh, distribution of arts funding in District 8 is extremely limited in comparison to the other districts. And uh, we need those resources. Barrio Logan has um, a plethora of arts organizations and artists that are very small organizations, but doing incredible work. And they don't get the recognition or the resources going forward. We're hoping that the museum will help um, help in that area so yeah I'll, i think i'll leave it there and let andy that's do great thank thing. you Th yeah thank you and i definitely want to return to some of those themes the uh borderlands and equity and even here in san diego how some people identify some of us so identify so, so strongly with the borderlands and other san diegans and oftentimes our elected officials don't so let's get to, let's get to that theme for sure uh but let me do first introduce uh, andy carey uh, Andy, appreciate your being here with us. Andy is executive director of the U.S.-Mexico Border Philanthropy Partnership. He's also uh, an adjunct uh, faculty member at University of San Diego, uh, teaching postgraduate courses on international nonprofit management. He uh, serves in many uh, different capacities uh, with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's National Advisory Committee and also the Independent Districting Commission in Escondido. Uh, I first met Andy because uh, he uh, jumped onto the Border Philanthropy Partnership at a similar time that I uh, joined a small philanthropic organization called the Foundation for Change. And so we both rode the, uh, the, the, the wild ride of the recession uh, of 2008, 9, and 10. Uh, and Andy, I'm looking forward to comparing notes with you about these times that we're living through. But first, uh, let me just welcome you uh, to Las Noticias from the Border and ask you also to share with us a little bit about what you're uh, working on these days. Kia Andy level, Andy Carey. Thank you, John. It's wonderful to be here with you, and I appreciate getting to meet uh, Josie and uh, the other members of uh, V International's uh, team that are making today's presentation possible. John, just as we met, as the economic downturn happened in 2008, here we are again facing a tremendous situation before the globe with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, through the Border Philanthropy Partnership, we are working to uh, support our member agencies along and across the region. Our community foundation and private foundation partners have absolutely answered the call. Uh, they've raised over $120 million to date to support various initiatives uh, to help nonprofits deliver food to the hungry, providing economic relief to unemployed, uh, medical equipment, support for daycare, uh, keeping first responders uh, with access to personal protection equipment. Uh, at the Border Philanthropy Partnership, we've been busy uh, not only supporting our member network, but also providing in-kind donations uh, to Mexico to set up temporary relief shelters for COVID-19 uh, support and services and vaccine, uh, or not vaccines, but uh, care for the people impacted. Um, as community partner to the Consulate General of Mexico in San Diego, uh, we're actually providing COVID testing at the consulates on Mondays. Yesterday, we had 127 members of our local community come to the consulate for on Columbus Day, we, uh, the day of the holiday. The consulate was technically closed, but in the parking lot area outside, we were able to provide uh, those services. And we're in the middle of um, Binational Border Health Week. It's really a month-long celebration, but uh, we've been busy um, making available services. Lots of people need access. Uh, to healthcare, we're helping guide them to get to the, our the free clinics all over San Diego County that will help get them taken care of, providing flu shots, uh, you name it. It is it's just a very, very busy time in the borderlands, but it's a good time to be a part of community and the border and philanthropy because uh, generosity continues to be abundant in our community and we're so appreciative to the to the donors and the partners uh, that make all this work possible. Here in our local community, the San Diego Foundation has absolutely answered the call. 
uh, they're at the front of the pack for community foundations raising money in the borderlands with over $50 million to date. Um, the International Community Foundation here in National City is just doing a remarkable job. They've sent, spent over or sent over $5 million in uh, donations and in-kind supports uh, into Mexico. So they're just we should be very proud of the effort of the San Diego Foundation and the International Community Foundation as San Diegans. They're absolutely waving the banner for philanthropy for our region. Yeah, and in fact, Via International has been uh, in those flows, both for food distribution in, in Barrio Logan, as well as uh, through our partner organization, uh, uh, Los Niños de Baja California in, in Tijuana. And he just uh, mentioned, uh, so perhaps some aren't as uh, familiar with the Border Philanthropy Partnership, but you mentioned your uh, uh, the BPP's member organizations. You have a, a San Diego base, but you're, you're really a membership organization of organizations strung along the entire length of the border. Is that right? Just say a word about how, how, the, how is the Border Philanthropy Partnership organized? We are indeed a member organization. We started in 2008 with 18 border region community foundations. And today we have 336 organizations from the entire 2000 mile border region, including groups from academia, business and corporate partners, uh, government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and philanthropy. So I appreciate that opportunity, John, to, yeah. uh, to tell your listeners and your audience about the work. Uh, it's rather remarkable. We're providing education and training, coaching and technical assistance, fiscal agency, uh, translation support, as well as uh, helping tell the story of the borderlands in a more positive context. Yeah. Uh, certainly not shying away from challenges that exist in our community, but as you know, uh, and your audience knows, the narrative about our region has been hijacked. It's been yeah. hijacked by Washington DC and Mexico City and uh, extreme media outlets trying to say that our border region is out of control. And those of us that live here know that our, our region is community and it's family and it's people and yeah. it's culture and it's not out of control. This is our home. And when you get to live in San Diego, you also get to live in Tijuana. We get yeah. to be from both sides of the border. And that's one of the things I love so much about this region is, you know, my best friends are from both sides of the border. The people that I work with, the, uh, they're family now, you know. Yeah. You know, we always talk about which side of the otro lado we're on. It gets so confusing. Yeah. You sometimes don't remember which side you've gone to because it's such um, a part of who we are when you live in the borderlands. Well, and that's something, uh, yes, yeah, so that we've been discussing in depth on this uh, series. Uh, some people would think of themselves as ni de aquí, ni de allá, but others think of themselves as de aquí y de allá, both at the same time. So, uh, and that's partly I want to pick up on this theme of uh, borderlands culture uh, and, and why is it that some of us uh, fall in love with the borderlands. Uh, uh, but I want to begin uh, this conversation by inviting uh, Josie to share a little bit of her story. I'll put her uh, spotlight, I'll add her so that both of you will be spotlighted for the moment. Uh, Josie, you were, you're, uh, uh, you were born and, and if I'm not mistaken, your family it goes back a couple of generations here in, in, in the San Diego borderlands. Would you tell us about, about that? Yeah, well, Somos de aquí, de allá. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, my family's been in uh, Barrio Logan. Actually, it was Logan Heights because the city renamed it Barrio Logan, but in Logan Heights since 1906. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, my family, uh, as I was saying, is from both sides, um, of Tijuana, Mexicali, and then uh, Bahia Comondú, Baja California Sur, yeah. Uh, on my mother's side, and then and Rio Yaki from my father's side. So we've we've been we've been here for a long time, and um, we've seen a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of disrespect, and we've seen um, a lot of compassion. Unfortunately, the disrespect and the and the negative treatment um, sometimes outshadows everything else, um, and thus. That's why we're working on the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center to actually be inclusive of the border region and tell the stories of Logan Heights. Um, as you know, this was a segregated community uh, based on restrictive residential covenants up yep. until the mid fifties. Um, so, you know, we all lived right in here if you were in, living in San Diego. I mean, yep. you could go to other places um, to live, but in San Diego, this is where you were restricted to live at. And so um, I had a great experience growing up. Uh, loved my community, still love my community. Um, so I, I was many years up in the Sacramento area 
but I've come back and um, I just wanted to clarify one thing on, on the introduction. Please. I didn't, I didn't solely do the uh, nomination for National Landmark. I did do the listing of Chicano Park on the National Register of Historic Places. I did do that. Gotcha. But the landmark was co-authored by another San Diegan, um, Manny Galavis. So I gotcha. just wanted to clarify that. Thank you for that clarification. And someday I want to chat with you at greater length about that with regard to Friendship Park and the monument down there, which is oh, yeah. uh, part of the national, it's a uh, national, uh, it's on the national registry, but it's not yet designated a national landmark. So that's a conversation I'll, I'll look forward to having with you sometime. Well, it, should, it should be to match the other one in Texas. Yeah, correct. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Josie, I knew that you had, well, you, and you went first to Northern California. You did uh, some of your education at Berkeley, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right? Yeah, I graduated from UC Berkeley. So did you always have in mind that you'd come back to the borderlands or like when you were at school or later when you were working? Did you always know that you would, uh, your fronterisa roots would kind of bring you back home? Or, or was there a time that you thought maybe the borderlands were just part of your your upbringing that you had moved on. No, 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 no. Uh, I remember being in school and one of my mentors, Dr. Arnaldo Solis, and I remember telling him, I've got, got to hurry up. I've got to hurry up. I've got to finish this education. And he says, what are you in a hurry for? I said, I got to go home. I got to go home and do my work. Yeah. And he says, your home is wherever you're at and your work is wherever you're at. Uh. So you may, and he says, you may never go home. And I went, uh, no, 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 that's not a reality. But what made sense was I couldn't wait till I get back home to do my work. So we immediately started doing work in uh, West Berkeley. We created a, a tutorial program using students from, this was before EOP and early outreach programs. Yeah. We created a tutorial program right there in West, uh, West Berkeley where a lot of the Rasa live. And then we created programs in East Oakland. So. And when I went to Sacramento, I was part of the, uh, I eventually uh, earned my wings through the Royal Chicano Air Force. And you didn't earn wings unless you were doing uh, 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 active community work. So uh, yes, when I had the opportunity to come back, I came back. Uh, but I was, I was always here. My, yeah, my family was here. Yeah. So I, I, I know that, I know that drive and I still drive it. <laughs> I hear what you're saying is that the fronteriza can leave the borderlands, but the borderlands never leave the fronteriza. Maybe <laughs> something like something like that. So, now Andy, uh, Andy, by contrast, you uh, you were new to the borderlands by and large uh, when you uh, started at BPP in 2008, or what was your? Uh, had you had some uh, uh, exposure to the borderlands before that time? I had worked in the Arizona Sonora border, but not in a border context. I know that okay. may sound a little strange, but um, I was working for Kiwanis International. And I was responsible for Central and South America, and we had a strong um, volunteer uh, contingent in the state of Sonora. And so we were, I'd been, my first trip was in 1993 uh, to Nogales, and then mm -hmm. uh, obviously coming to the Board of Philanthropy Partnership here in San Diego in 2008. Yeah. So then but in the, this Kiwanis role, you, uh, had you traveling around Latin America, as I remember you telling me the story. Yes. So yes. you were very much uh, you were very much oriented toward Mexico, Central and Latin America, uh, but then the Border Philanthropy Partnership really you know kind of planted you here in the in the borderlands. Is that fair a fair way of saying it? It, it did. I was looking to lead an organization uh, using my uh, language skills, and I found the Border Philanthropy Partnership, and I was fortunate enough to be accepted. Yeah. And so tell me, Andy, just as you look back on 2008, 9, 10, what, what, what was it that, uh, how come you're still hanging around? What was it that made you? No, uh, it's interesting. John, yeah. when I was hired, they asked me to, to consider the post for at least three years, and now I'm in year 12. Yeah. Uh, I love what we do. Um, it's amazing to get to work between the United States and Mexico. Uh, the people in this region are just simply extraordinary. Uh, we understand each other very well. Uh, we support each other. Uh, what happens to one side impacts the other, and we all understand that, and we, we have a concern for each other on both sides. You know, we, don't, we want Mexico to do well. They want America to do well. And so it's, it's a great opportunity to, to be a part. And there's so much to do. You know, there's so much misinformation out there. And so to, uh, I think we all have a huge responsibility to tell the real story of our region. Uh, we're engaged in a conversation now with the U.S. Congress about uh, a humanitarian response to the borderlands and dealing with the migration con uh, conversation. And we're, yeah. we went to Congress last October 
to talk to them about the repatriation process and how it needs to change. We didn't yeah. tell them to stop repatriating people. We're not being political. But we're talking about we can't lose our humanity. Yeah. Uh, we need to treat people with dignity and respect and make sure they're reacquainted with their families. And we encourage them actually to work with the nonprofit sector. We have great success in Tijuana and San Diego of uh, community organizations uh, helping guide these people in very difficult situations and getting them information about getting a job or getting reacquainted with their visas and yeah. a right to work and contact with their family. You know, in medical lanes exist between San Diego and Tijuana, but medical lanes don't exist in every port of entry. We ask Congress to make sure that medical lanes do exist. So when people need medical care on one side of the border, they can be expedited across uh, to get care on the other side. You know, yeah. we're in the middle of the census and it's a uh, political football right now because they stop it, they start it, they stop yeah. it. And we're currently started again, but we need to know who's here. We need to know how many people are here. It's going to impact our schools, our our governance, it's gonna impact a lot of things. We need to know what's happening. So we asked Congress to stop the politicking around the census. You know, and philanthropy is so important in our region. We asked them to protect the charitable tax deduction for people that itemize. Yeah. You know, we need every incentive out there to encourage uh, the citizens of this great country to support nonprofit organizations and charity. And yeah. one of the best ways to do that is to protect the individual tax deduction. Andy, let me ask you also about your, uh, I know you're uh, very rooted in uh, Escondido, which is where you're, uh, you're raising fam your family. And uh, do you think of the, es do you think of Escondido as a border, uh, a border community? And, and uh, what, tell us a little bit about Escondido. Absolutely. You know, Escondido is an amazing place. Uh, we ended up here because it's affordable. Yeah. Uh, San Diego County is a very expensive place to live. And we found Escondido, we're 19 miles inland uh, from the ocean. And it's a community of about 153,000 people. We're about 53% Hispanic. Yeah. And so, you know, I would say we're more than a, a border community. We are uh, the exact understanding of what it means to be a multinational community. I live in a community called Eureka Springs. And my neighbors are from all over the world. My yeah. good friend across the street is from Iran. The people next door to us are from the Dominican Republic in Afghanistan. Uh, we have people here from the Philippines, from China, from Russia, yeah. from Guatemala, from Mexico. Uh, the people down the street from me are from Mexicali. Uh, yeah. You know, we're so from global, everywhere here. Yeah, that global, uh, that global kind of aperture, right, from the borderlands, San Diego, Tijuana, onto the world is part of the borderlands history, but it's so powerful, I think, in these days. Josie, tell me, uh, so you've been, you know, after working away, coming back, uh, you know, uh, so strongly rooted in the borderlands. I'll ask, make, ask each of you to comment on this, but what is, uh, what's the one thing, if you're in that kind of conversation, which we've all had, where somebody has never been to the border or they don't understand the border, what's the one thing you try to tell them about the border to try to give them a glimpse of, of what the living along the border is really like? Is there a particular story you like to tell or a, uh, an emphasis you like to draw? Uh, Josie, what do you try to tell folks about the borderlands if you have that opportunity? That, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> um, it's a hard question for me to answer because I remember the borderlands before the militarization of it. Yeah. And so my family, uh, my my grandma, uh, we would go back and forth all the time, and yeah. uh, <clears throat> and uh, it wasn't a problem. Uh, but now, uh, you know, everybody sees the border. They think of the traffic for crossing, and yes. they just they just kind of see a negative um, environment. And uh, I think for me, the beauty of both sides of the border, um, I don't see the border. I yeah. don't see a border, yeah. um, except for what the, the uh, you know, this government has put in place to make it so difficult. And then this stupid wall um, that is crossing Kumeyaay land and yeah. digging up uh, areas that are sacred to the Kumeyaay yeah. um, and to the Toto Odom in Arizona. And it's yeah. just, it's, um, it's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. That hardening and militarization of the border, you know, 30, a 30 year project. I mean, it's been going on before that, but really both parties dedicated to that proposition for 30 years has really, you know, cast a, a, a pall over these conversations. I agree. But yeah, that sense of uh, movement back and forth and fluidity back and forth is not what it once was. But the culture, of course, uh, remains uh, fluid in this way. 
Andy, how about you? What do you, you you're probably uh, in a lot of these conversations in other parts of the country. Do you have a go-to uh, uh, elevator speech or a story you like to tell? You know, it's so funny because everybody immediately goes to the negative, right? They yeah. try to say, oh my gosh, how can you live there? It must be so dangerous. And we just laugh, you know, because yeah. it's not dangerous to live here. So we constantly tell them about how we go back and forth. And I remind everybody that in my 30 years of travel around the borderlands and in Central and South America, that I've only been robbed once and it was in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, just telling them how safe it is and how you go back and forth and about gathering with friends and going to restaurants and uh, enjoying cultural activities and yeah. uh, just how we engage on a day-to-day -day basis and yeah. constantly telling that story about the the important uh, just how wonderful it is here you know and how much I love Mexico yo amo mexico it's yeah. it's my second home <laughs> yeah well tell maybe this is a flip side to this uh, same question but what's your one great hope uh, uh, Josie uh, Andy what what if there's one, uh, one great hope you'd have for the borderlands, you know, uh, looking ahead uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, what would you like to be able to tell somebody when they ask you about the border? What might you hope you could say was the reality on the ground? Do you have a, a hope for the future you'd like to share? <laughs> well, um, without going too political, but uh, we get rid of this president. And well, there we is that. There is that, isn't that? <laughs> and we change the trajectory going forward and we um, we establish more firm interactions and binational exchanges. What never ceases to amaze me when I travel, and uh, let me just say this, being in South Texas or even in San Antonio, when you watch the news, they show you <clears throat> the weather. I'm just gonna use the weather as an example, but you see the weather from you know, the United States into Mexico. San Diego, you see the weather, and then it like, it's oh. like there's no weather at the other side of the border. And I'm going, this is the border region. How do you do that? You know, how do you not look at the entire region? So um, I would say my dream is that there's more um, interaction, binational exchanges, and appreciation of the richness of the culture that, uh, that uh, the interaction and the that produces our, our binational uh, people. I mean, I think of artists such as uh, Victor Ochoa living on both sides of the border, or, you know, uh, uh, other friends that I know that live in San Francisco that are from Tijuana, grew up in Chula Vista, and the arts that they're doing is definitely reflective of their experience. And I think that as we go forward, if we can change the tra trajectory and make it more inclusive, I think we'll have a stronger region and a stronger nation. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, Andy, how about you? Uh, hope for the future? You know, I hope we start investing uh, in humanity on both sides of the border. We're currently, we're on defense. We're all about building walls and fences and security infrastructure. And all the people want to do is be able to come together to work, to play, to enjoy. Uh, and we need to get all that other stuff simply out of the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are one region and you know i would like to give a shout out to our friends at utep the university of texas in el paso you know when the kids in juarez want to go to el, to utep they get to pay in-state tuition and that was imagine that in the great state of texas that they had the fortitude to allow people uh from the mexican side of the border to attend a texas university and pay in-state tuition but what they did is they understood the impact that the juarenses have on the el paso economy and so they said, look, they're just as much a part of our community as we are of theirs. And so they have all these young people coming across. They're learning to speak both English and Spanish. And we're prepping our people to stay in our region. We need to replace ourselves. Who's going to run our businesses, and work in our law firms? And who's going to take care of our, our patients in the hospital? You know, yeah. we our people here. Yeah, you've, you've both to this, uh, you know, phenomenon of San Diego, which is, is in, in many ways a very distinctive border town for the United States because it's so large, so wealthy, and because it's city center, you know, sits 14, 15 miles north of the border. And so that many San Diegans, as you both, uh, both well know, can, you know, you can live uh, your life in San Diego uh, without ever really considering yourself a part of the borderlands. You can insulate and uh, create a bubble for yourself as, as many San Diegans do. And as you mentioned, Josie, this is, you know, historically, uh, was, uh, Inst institutionalized, right, with policies like redlining and other forms of 
you know, discrimination. Is there something about San Diego uh, you think that, that uh, is it just the geographic distance of the city center from the border or is it the, you know, the wealth uh, in the northern parts of the county that, that makes San Diegans, so many San Diegans sort of stop thinking uh, that there's anything, even weather, <laughs> south of the border? Uh, or what do you think, what do you, how do you all see the larger San Diego when you look to the north from, from Barrio Logan, for instance, Josie, or when you look to the west from Escondido? Uh, Andy, what do you, how, what, what's that future you know, like? I would say, you know, the, the, the government of San Diego, our city government, I think really gets the notion of Tijuana is important, Mexico is yeah. important, Baja California is important. I think we knocked that out of the park. And I think we knocked it out of the park no matter what political persuasion you are. Uh, you know, so the governments, the economies, I think, you know, the people at Sandag, there's all this collaboration going on to foster greater business and cultural ties. And I, so I think our elected officials get it. Our congressional delegation, not so much. You know, Daryl yeah. Issa, uh, not to go political here, our organization typically doesn't. He was in Congress, but he was always against everything about the border. He was yeah. always about strengthening the border, make it more difficult to cross. Well, he's now running again to, to serve in Congress and he wants to be my con uh, congressman here in North County. Yeah, I can't think of anything uh, more devastating to the U.S.-Mexico relationship than having more members of Congress that don't support the binational relationship. Yeah, yeah, and I see, uh, Josie, you you can tell us about arts and culture organizations. Uh, you mentioned your collaboration. You know, Via is very well connected to the universities here, all of which have their own, uh, you know, institutes, uh, departments, faculty members, of course, who are engaged in these binational relationships with their colleagues. So I see that, you know, they, they're often kind of, in my experience, a little scattered and every university has to create its own, you know, uh, system, of course. Uh, so that's hard to, you know, coordinate and collaborate sometimes. But Josie, how do you see, uh, how do you see San Diegans, I know you, you, your opinion piece last week talked about the underfunding of arts organizations in South uh, San Diego, in District 8, for instance, of the city. Uh, how do you see the larger San Diego or the dominant culture uh, uh, and power brokers in San Diego, their perspective on the border and how, how, how can we, how can that change over time or can it? Is it just so ingrained that some San Diegans will just forever have their heads stuck in the sand when it comes to this kind of stuff? Well, you know, I'm going to go back to the militarization of the border because I can remember growing up in San Diego where there wasn't the tension that there is now. And I think, I think, um, San Diego's always been a pretty conservative um, area. And I think, in my opinion, uh, with the Navy uh, here, I mean, it's always been this kind of militaristic uh, environment, uh, Navy retirement. And then there's always been a very distinct difference between this side of the border and that side of the border. Not, I don't think within the community, I think in general, you're talking about it in generalities. Yeah. And I think that distinction carries over into the educational system. And yeah. I think we're not teaching enough uh, curriculum that makes sense to the broader masses that incorporates our communities so that there is an ingrained uh, vision of the border region. Yeah. Um, this whole you know, English only initiative back in the 90s made it even more distinct. And so schools have to deal with that when you're dealing with you know, ESL. When my kids were going to school and, and I identified them, they spoke both languages somewhat, but more English than Spanish. And they put them in ESL classes. And then I got to see the ESL process. And it's very discriminating and it's very yeah. um, lack of challenge to the students. And so what happens yeah. is you create these digital divides in education and our kids grow up with this somewhat inferiority complex you know military retirement you got a lot of people coming from mexico that don't want to be chicano because they don't understand the experience of the chicano on this side of the border i think we're dealing with a whole lot of dynamics that can't be answered in two minutes yeah. I, I just think it's broader than 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 the question is uh, that's being asked I hear you. Yeah, thank you for that. There's a comment in the chat room from Jim Gerber about all Texas public universities on the border allow Mexican citizens to attend and pay in-state tuition since the early 2000s. And uh, this, he's asking about Spanish language instruction in, in San Diego schools. Why isn't there more of that? And why isn't there more of this kind of cultural, uh, uh, cultural um, capacitacion, right? 
uh, in San Diego uh, for uh, the region in which we live. It is, I, I, you know, I was raised in La Jolla. I was raised in that bubble and it was only, uh, you know, a series of life circumstances that, you know, I kind of got kicked out of the bubble, but I'll, I'll tell that story another time. But uh, yeah, the, the sense of, yeah, I, I also like your observation, Josie, about the military, because of course, you know, the military with its historic presence in San Diego, and now the Department of Homeland Security with its enormous, you know, presence in San Diego, these are federal agencies, you know, far, far away, and they often send their, their people come in and go out, right? They come on short shifts, they're here for short periods of time, they never in many ways become a part of, of the community. Uh, like you say, there's so many dynamics at work, but um, I do wonder about more, you know, the old joke, right, about the real border is Highway 94 or Highway 8, you know, more collaboration between North and South San Diego would, would start moving us in that direction, it seems to me. I think, John, there's the mentality uh, among the citizens of them and us. Yeah. And what happens is then you get, uh, locked into the them and us. And I think a lot of our citizens, the Rasa, especially coming over new to the new to the area, maybe recent immigrants sometimes don't want to be viewed as them or us and they start to assimilate. And I think we can't afford that because they lose their culture. Um, I remember in the 70s and you know, this may or may not be true, but at, at Berkeley, um, I can't remember his name right now because I wasn't thinking about it, but he was a, a collector. He taught at Berkeley and he was a collector of music, especially Chicano music. And they went to Mexico City during the, the late 60s, early 70s. And, the, and we were valuing Mexican traditional music more than Mexicanos were. And the same thing with Dia de los Muertos. The Chicanos have revived a lot of the traditional culture that now, you know, and, and it's always been in Mexico, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, how do you say, put forth the way it is today. And I think, I think what happens with this them and us is, is the big schism that we all deal with. And that's why I think our turning wheel bus is going to be so important as we work different communities and set up different places for yeah. hotspots. Because right now with the, con with the COVID, so many of our kids are falling behind and we can't afford to lose them. We need to keep them with us and we need to keep the pride of culture within them and the language strong. And so um, I don't know if that's the exact solution because one bus isn't gonna turn everything around, sure. but it is, it is the mentality going forward that if people embrace that uniqueness of what and who we are, I think we can't be anything better. I can remember working with this woman at uh, Southwest Airlines. They were gonna do a grant and um, she was out of San Antonio and she was so excited. They were going down to Brownsville and they were gonna do this beautiful mural in Spanish and English. And I, I, I questioned her, you know, I, I knew her pretty well. And I said, oh, do you get in any kind of hot water with, you know, being a bilingual? And she said, oh no. She says in, in South Texas, all the Americanos are learning to speak Spanish in order yeah. to survive. Whereas over here, we're keeping that divide bigger yeah. and then it leads to, how do you say, more questions and yeah. more of they and us. And yeah. so, you yeah, know, it's, it's that building, building, building bridges within our own communities in a funny way does break down, uh, you know, that, that nationalist mindset, right, of us and them or th this side of the border. I'll not forget, Josie, I've not heard it before, but your observation that, you know, San Diego news stations don't show weather in Tijuana. That, that is so, that really is so emblematic of so much of what is wrong. Andy, what about you? Do you have a, uh, what, what's, what do you see percolating uh, as far as cultural capacitacion or maybe in the field of philanthropy or other you find more more philanthropic organizations showing an interest in in the border. I know the border is so much in the news with migration and the wall and that kind of stuff. But is there is there a, are people building bridges within the field of philanthropy uh, toward in the direction of the borderlands? Absolutely. You know, there's a the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation is engaged in an initiative right now about helping American-based community foundations to partner with Mexico-based community foundations to help uh, increase investment in Latino communities across the United States, largely in Mexican American communities, and then to help those people that are contributing to their communities in Mexico to do it through community foundations. And uh, here in the borderlands, we have people from El Paso, from Arizona, from uh, San Diego, 
uh, from Laredo. Uh, they're in San Antonio, in Boston, and other parts of the country that are participating, Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, where they're engaged in this to help uh, grow philanthropy and to help people understand that they can make a difference. There's a lot of expats. 35 million Mexicans live in the United States. Um, and there's a lot of them want to do good things back home. And so yeah. organizations like Border Philanthropy Partnership, International Community Foundation, and others can help make that a reality for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. Several folks in our chat room are asking me to give a shout out to our own Escuela Amistad via language learning program where people get to learn language, the Spanish language, by through making friends with people in, in Mexico. So our teachers are Tijuana based. And we have a program called Charla Amigos, uh, friends that you can chat with to practice your Spanish, all of whom are Tijuana based, many of them migrants and deportees. So that kind of the language, our notion is that you learn, uh, you really, the best way to learn a language is by making friends with somebody who speaks the language. And Escuela Amistad, uh, thank you for encouraging me I, to give a little plug for uh, something that we're working on here at Via International. Hey, hey John, John yeah. one, of the one of the things that stays in my mind is I can remember when Tijuana was a suburb of San Diego. Yeah. And now San Diego is a suburb suburb of Tijuana. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the people that live in San Diego don't realize that that yeah. has changed. Yeah, when I, well, I, the, the, the very short version of me getting kicked out of the bubble was that I was sent to serve as a pastor in Calexico for, and lived for four <laughs> years. Talk about a sub, I mean, Calexico is a, the northernmost suburb of Mexicali in every way imaginable. And uh, that was part of what uh, first, uh, you know, threw me into the deep end. I had to learn Spanish quickly because in Calexico, even if you look like me, people are going to talk to you in Spanish because there's no reason for you being in Calexico if you don't speak some Spanish. So, uh, yeah, but that again, this distinctiveness, San Diego is not, most of our border cities are much larger U.S., uh, sorry, much larger Mexican cities across from much smaller U.S. populations. And those U.S. populations are typically much more overwhelmingly of Mexican ancestry. So there's a kind of a, uh, there's a, a, a kind of kinship or cultural solidarity built in. At least that's my experience of the. Well, and 40% of the border region population lives in the San Diego, Tijuana region. Yes. So of yeah. the 15 million people that live here, 40% of us live right here in San Diego, Tijuana. Yeah. And wouldn't it be nice if San Diego, Tijuana together really sort of owned its identity as almost like the, the capital or the cultural capital of the borderlands? You know, that would be a conversation I'd love to see unfold where. San Diegans and Tijuanenses would uh, together collaboratively, you know. You know it's uh, interesting. The cross border express that opened up has just been a, a magnificent experience yeah. for all of us. But you know, everybody thought San Diego would be the uh, the lead uh, hub for the, where the passenger traffic came from, and it's not. We're only about one percent of the total population using CPX. It's everybody from Northern California, from or Los Angeles or further north up towards San Francisco. Those are the ones that are using the cross-border express in significant numbers. Isn't that interesting? So once again, San Diegans don't, we haven't really caught on to the potential and the opportunity of living <laughs> on the border. Yeah. You know, and if you're traveling to Mexico City, you can fly there for half the cost if you go out of the Tijuana airport. Right, right. Yeah, and of course, uh, yeah, the, the, the cross-border express is a model for what uh, a campaign that we're working on also called, uh, build that park to create a a design for what a truly binational park would look like out there where your photo is, Sandy, behind you, you know. So to think binationally, to create binationally, to build relationships and, and cultural collaborations uh, across borders, within communities, across these national boundaries, it's such fascinating work, isn't it? I find it so uh, inspiring and, and challenging, but uh, yeah. Well, it's I, exciting, I, John, is since I've been here, and I'm not taking credit for it, but there's just Every day there's another group or there's a new interest. You know, we work closely with the Smart Border Coalition. They're just work, yeah. working tirelessly to grow those ties. And they agree with a lot of the things that Josie and I have said. And they're working, you know, they don't like the wall. They see it as an impediment to bringing people and commerce back and forth across the border. And these are, you know, uh, business leaders in our community just have done really well. And they're uh, looking to make it a better experience for everybody. And so we appreciate their great contribution to our local community. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you both uh, very, very much for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to uh, prepare us to close out. If you're willing and able to stick around for a few more minutes uh, uh, just to chat with our friends here at our Zoom meeting. Uh, but I do want to say uh, thank you very much, Andy Carey, uh, Josephine Talamantes. And I, I do want to, before we go, a couple of announcements. Yeah, Josie, do you have something to share before yeah, we I go? Was, I was going to say one of the things that we didn't talk, talk about were the indigenous, indigenous communities 
on both sides of the border. And Thank hopefully, you. Uh, once the Chicano Park Museum and Cultural Center opens up, it will be um, another avenue to bridge uh, communities that are on both sides of the border. In particular, we'll, our base is, Log is Barrio Logan, Logan Heights, um, and hopefully we will work with the um, Kumeyaay and the other uh, indigenous communities here and also partner with institutions in Tijuana, Mexicali and beyond to bridge those gaps. Thank you very much for that. Yes, and, and a good shout out and a reminder, and I'd love to get a, a, that conversation into our Tuesday uh, interview series as well. So uh, help me out with that, folks. Leads uh, from our Kumeyaay friends who would uh, join this conversation here at Via International. Just a quick- uh, uh, Real quick, the Casa Mexico is finally going to be a reality in Balboa Park, and that's yeah. very, yeah. very exciting for this conversation. Yeah. Muchos años, muchos años. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, folks, a uh, couple of quick announcements. Next week, my guest will be uh, Pedro Rios of the American Friends Service Committee, uh, Paola Villasenor, the artist uh, known as Panca. So please join us. We're here at Tuesdays at noon, uh, live stream on Facebook. If you'd like to uh, join the Zoom conversation, just uh, reach out to us at viainternational.org or viacafe.org, and we'll put you on our list. Um, and let me uh, just invite you to join me all in uh, giving uh, one last uh, uh, round of applause to our guests, Andy Carey and Josephine uh, Talamantes. Uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Hasta la próxima.